Uh, so today I'll be talking on uh, Scalable's front-end architecture. I put the word front-end to make it fancy. It's mostly about CSS, and it has no. Uh, I mean, I won't be covering JavaScript and stuff. Uh, hi, as uh, India has already introduced, my name is Praveen. Uh, I'm also known as Asana on Twitter. I generally rant about bad coding practices and make fun of SEO experts. And I work in a company called Pulitzer as a web developer. Okay, how many of you here uh, write CSS as part of their day job? Okay, almost. So how do you find it when, when you are working in a big large team and you are given a project which has been written by someone else and you get those CSS files and like how do you keep them in? Huh? Okay, I mean generally you look, look at the code, feel happy and uh, you say how oh, such an awesome developer he is or generally you start off with a So generally it happens that uh, I mean, in large teams some of, uh, some of the developers might not write the CSR properly. Okay, uh, they might be using decent and selected which uh, make our lives very really tough. Uh, this happens to me most of the time. Whenever I see code, I just first thing is I curse the developer, then I refactor the code, then I start. Okay. We all follow web standards, right? I mean, we write semantic HTML. We Pardon? We write. We write. Okay, but mostly we try to stick to the web standards, like writing a standard semantic HTML, then uh, you know, uh, writing properly separating everything, like CSS separating a separate file, all JavaScript in a separate file, and HTML. Okay, so what happens generally, like whenever you start off the project with the, okay, this is a fresh project, I'll start off very nicely, I'll, uh, you know, it would be a good example of uh, well written CSS and stuff. But slowly, as the project grows, the CSS grows to the site and it becomes un unmaintainable. Uh, then, yeah, we have certain CSS best practices, so called best practices, like, not to use more classes. They call they call it class agents. And uh, yeah, what all other CSS best practices are there? Anyone? Like, what's your favorite CSS best practice? Okay, you will do different dot CSS so that the that's the basic thing. No, apart from that, I'm talking about the selectors. Are there any proper rules on how to write class names? Don't make classes as presentation levels, but as different layout classes. Okay, so generally, this is a bit, uh, we are asked to write classes that properly, you know, defines the content. Okay, so that's considered to be a best practice. But what ha what happens is that thing is not reusable. Suppose you have news, news content, then you give a class dot news, fine? And you have the same style to be applied to some other block, then you cannot use that news no more because that is uh, reserved for that news content. So these CSS best, best practices, so called best practices, they encourage what I mean, if you come to programming world, you will call all that as uh, data. And yeah, see, suppose uh, you have a news content, you are using news class. In future, you have another block which which has updates, which, has, uh, which is not related to news. But using the news class makes it little, you know, less meaningful. Yeah, so using that name, I'm talking about that name, news no longer scalable. I mean, it sounds very funny. We, we have a updates and it's called news. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. 
then CSS is often contextually unreadable. So, what I mean with this is you have descendant selectors, right? So you might have seen this. In most of the cases, you have a sidebar, then you have a specific module, uh, different modules. Then for each header in the module, you say dot module history, then you write the rules. So what happens is all those rules they are specific to that sidebar. If you have to move that content anywhere else, then that won't apply. So it's the problem. Then CSS encourages overrides. You might be knowing this. Yeah, any question? Then the worst part is it encourages bad coupling. Uh, so let's take this as an example. Okay, we have a sidebar. Inside the sidebar, we have a specific module which I wrote mod class. Then I have a heading and a content. And if we use this selector, hash sidebar dot mod three x three, what's happening is we are just type, we are making an <coughs> assumption that every module would be of the same form. It will always be x three. And suppose uh, in other context, semantically it makes sense to use x two. Then this selector no longer is useful. This is not scalable. So, in order to make code more, you know, scalable and easy to organize, there is a methodology called object-oriented CSS. This was developed by Nicole Sullivan. And when I say object-oriented, it has nothing to do with object-oriented programming as such. Here, we treat every HTML component as an object. Okay. The main principles are separate structure and content, and separate container and content, uh, structure and screen, and container and content. Oh. Okay, I think it's better to show you the example. This is how we generally use this thing. We have a class for the structure of that object, okay, so that that can be reused. And if you have any changes that needs to be made to that object, we can extend it using a skin, I mean, a class, which I call it here a skin class. <laughs> Similarly, base and extend, I mean, it's, it, these things come from object-oriented programming paradigm, so you can call it. Okay, now let's come back to our previous example. We had a sidebar, same thing. Okay? But instead of using an X3 and instead of using an X3 uh, selector and P selector, we have made it generalized. We are using a class called HD for the header and BD for the body. So that if suppose we, uh, in some other context, in, instead of X3, X2 makes more sense. We can straight away use H2, use the same class, they still be usable. Do you see any problem in this uh, selector here? Dot mod HD, dot mod BD. There might be a problem. Unnecessary class. Mm. Uh, at first, it seems it's unnecessary, but you know, this makes it more, see, what is more flexible? Suppose you have another H2 or H4 in the same place, then instead of the previous thing, you would have written dot mod H3, comma dot mod H4, and so on and so forth. So every time you add an HTML structure, you again change your CSS. That's not a good thing, right? I mean, it's tightly coupled. Yeah. You can have the content in the presentation setting. If you are in the case of the last year, all the standards are separated from the people who are in the back of the board, the people who are in the back of the board, the people who are in the back of the board, the people who are in the back of the board, the people who are in the back of the board, the people who are in the back of the board, the people who are in the back of the
yeah that's what we learn when we learn learn about css right we we will keep the html constant and we keep on changing the css to redesign the site but in real world that never happens in real world you always change the html these days who writes html hand I mean by hand all of them all of it is generated to wordpress or some content management system so it makes more sense to have classes like this yeah First, take all the P's, yeah, then uh, all the P and you look then if it, it's a direct kind of model. So this way my spectrum is more effective. These are more yeah. It is performance also. Yeah. And yeah, as we said, uh, ideally in ideal world we'll have the HTML constant, we'll be changing the CSS. But uh, I don't think we'll show me one example other than CSS Zen Garden where we keep the HTML constant and keep working on CSS. I don't think so. <laughs> CSS Zen Garden. Uh, never heard of it? It's a pretty famous site by Dave Shia. Yeah. Yeah, there are very, very, very special examples. Yeah, very specific examples where the structure is very simple. Like you have a header, paragraph, an image, and if the structure is not so complex, then it's fine. I mean, you'll be using changing CSS most of the time. But if you look at most complicated websites, like say for example Amazon, Flipkart, okay, we have so many modules. So if you have to change one particular thing, if you use the traditional way, like just uh, keeping the HTML constant and changing the CSS, you might be affecting some other stuff also. This makes sense. Pardon? Yeah. And also, uh, let's say we are not using these classes and we are just using uh, element selectors. Like previously, we had dot mod h2. Suppose we have some other model here, dot mod uh, h4, and it has a different uh, background, I mean, some different styling. Then you keep on adding. I mean, what we are doing is. By using uh, element selector, we are making an assumption that the structure is always going to be the same. So it would be a mod, there would be a H3 after that, it might not be nested inside somewhere. But in this case, it doesn't depend on this. This H2 can be nested inside some division or somewhere, but still this thing applies to that. Yeah, but I still see some problem here. Can you figure out what the problem is? Yeah, multi if you have multiple paragraphs, you will have to use this same class. Yeah. Yeah, but suppose you have another mod and there you need a different setting for the p tag. Then what would you do? In that case, again, you have to add a class, then you have one more line of CSS. And suppose there comes another mod because of the client requirement. Again, you add one more CSS. So every time you change this, even you are touching the CSS, that's not proper separation. When we separate HTML and CSS, it should be like that. Uh, if you touch one of them, one of them should be constant. So, uh, that, that was what we learned when we started off with CSS, right? That we won't be touching HTML, we will be changing only CSS. But that's not, that doesn't happen in real life. We, every time the HTML changes. So every time the HTML changes, we need to come back, rework on the CSS, again, look at it. So, huh, yeah, I was talking about some problem with this, this selection. <laughs> No, no, I mean, if you want, you can use dot mod and I mean, right now I don't have any background or anything, any styling for this thing, so I haven't used it. Yeah, one problem what I see is this is specific to only this module. Okay, this H2, I mean, every element with HD class and BD class. It makes sense only if it is inside a mod. Again, I am making an assumption 
that these elements would always be wrapped inside a division or a container with mod class. So again, we are imposing some constraint. It is we cannot freely move this stuff somewhere else. To <coughs> avoid that, uh, in object-oriented CSS methodology, we have this thing called double standard heading hierarchy, which sounds very fancy, but uh, it's something sim I mean, very simple to always do. Basically, what we do is, uh, whenever you define a uh, heading, if it's, uh, this one we use only for heading, that is H1 to H6. Whenever you define a style, uh, write a rule for heading, you define the same thing, I mean, same rule for a class. This is how it would look. See, h1, comma, dot h1. And similarly, h6, comma, dot h6. So, this makes it more uh, usable and flexible. Suppose, in, in this case, we don't rely on the semantics of this h2, h3, and stuff, right? Suppose in some place I want h1 to look, uh, to have the styles that are written over here. But in some other page, as per the semantics of the document, the h1 comes in the top, but it needs to look somewhere like h3. It has a similar look of h3. Then directly we can use dot h3, and still the code would be semantic because we are using an h1 tag. And since, you know, classes have more specific specificity, this, uh, if you use an h dot h3, that would uh, override, that would take more precedence. And uh, whenever you design a website, I don't think you would need more than six headings. If you count, it max will be six. If there are anything else, you can just add one more class and be done with it. Not a problem. Good question. Yeah. Why are you adding x1 and then adding dot x1? Should we keep our constant uh, consistency in the style? Just keep dot x1. And they were heading to R, which is the final style of The reason I'm using it is to have a default setting for H1. So if I have an H1 and if I don't uh, assign any class to it, my default should get some styling, right? So these are the default stylings which you call the base stylings. At the same time, you are giving the same styling to other classes. So here these are not uh, limited only to headings. You can, if you want the same look, for a paragraph, you can use the same class. So just by defining six things, you can have you know any number of combinations if you want. Then one more interesting thing that comes from object-oriented CSS methodology is media object. Uh, media object is a very simple thing. It has an image to the left with some descriptive content on the right. If you look at Facebook, uh, look at any comment, any update. Your friends, uh, avatar box, yeah, take Twitter for example, anything. You have an image to the left and some content to the right. So, by looking at that thing, what you can assume there is always an image which floats, image or a media which floats, there is some content to the right. This is always constant. So, this is something you can extract a separate object and you can keep reusing it. How do we reuse it? Okay, this is what I was talking about. This is how a media block would look. Most of the time it has some media on the left, content on the right. It may happen that you have media on the right and content on the left too. Okay, I think better if I show you some examples of this. This is something I uh, took it from Flipkart. If you look at Flipkart, on the rightmost uh, sidebar, you have these two blocks. So what I did, I copied the same HTML, whatever Flipkart wrote. I didn't change anything here. And this is how the So if you look at the layout I mean, look at this UI, you have two blocks which almost share same styling. They have something on the left, okay, some number on the left, some content on the right, there is a read more link. But if you look at the marker, 
by the way, I am not uh, trying to find faults with the Flipkart Flipkart desk. This, this is just an example. We have the case module. Uh, this is fine, right? Okay. So we have a class a case module. I don't know why. Uh, Maybe because of the way the HTML gets generated, they have it. They have a box replacement, then body, then the unit. This is a really good thing. They have extracted all uh, floating objects as units. So whenever you assign a class unit, that gets floated. And the last unit generally it clears the float and it goes to the rest. Then we have a text text two. Read more link inside that again. There is uh, something. Okay. Now, if you look at the second thing, second box, it almost looks similar. But look at the code. Here we have directly two blocks: cell one, cell two. And for cell one, again they have text one, text two. There is this header link. And if you look at the CSS. This one is for the first module. FK box replacement dot text one. FK box replacement dot text two. So what's happening here is again we are making an assumption that uh, anything that has this style always is always wrapped inside this specific class, the a container with this specific class. So once we take it and move it to some other division or some other container, entire thing is lost. I mean. If you just take the HTML code somewhere else, it doesn't get that uh, look. Suppose I take this thing out and that thing. I just use the same HTML, put it here, but we didn't. Uh, we are not recreating anything out of the CSS. Actually, it's as good as styling, uh, as good as inline styling, almost. So what we can do is just again go back to the exact look at this. Uh, just observe what all other repeat uh, stuff that's being repeated. We have something that's floating left. Okay, so. I uh, kind of modified this. This might not be ideal one, but just for the sake of this uh, demo, I have done this. I'm using a case module just because they have used it. Inside, I have abstracted this entire thing as a media object. So I call if, uh, anything, any component that has a media to the floating to the left and some content to the right. I call it a media object. So this is a media object. Inside. I have a media. Okay, uh, this might be T, that might be T, X2, whatever doesn't matter because I am using the class name here. So it's very extensible. You can use whatever element you want. Then we have media body. Media body is something that uh, comes to the right. Then we have a header, but. Uh, I have again specified H2 so that I can apply styles to the H2 class. Then we have this more link. Fine. And if you look at the second code, second module, again the same thing. I have a media object, I have a media, media body, H2, but the class is H3 because semantically it should be an H2, but uh, the look. It's a little bit different. Uh, it's, uh, font size is a little bit uh, smaller, so I have used an extra there. But more or less, few minutes. Yeah, this is the wanted version using the abstraction. So if you look at the CSS file, this is the original version, which has around 131 lines. Then 
the abstract equation. Seventy-eight lines. Within seventy-eight lines, we have abstracted that code. And just to demo how powerful this abstraction is, I have made one more module here. Again, it's a media. Uh, there is a media. See, in the previous example, I had uh, used this media on a P tag. But here, I can use on whatever I want. So I use it on image because there is one image on the left. Then I have a media body. Some heading, content, read more. And if I look at this, we have this thing ready made. I mean, we really work in it much on this thing separately. We already have a component ready with us. So these are the advantages of using when I mean, following this object oriented methodology. Apart from um, header, headings, and media object, we have few other stuff which I mean, I personally didn't like that much. Like we have, uh, uh, we have these selectors for all padding, margin stuff. So whenever you want to give a margin of 10 pixels, you can add dot uh, mark 10. But I didn't like that because I don't know. It was as good as writing inline styling again. So these are the good parts I found in object-oriented CSS. Uh, by the way, if you have any like queries right now, you can start. Uh, you can feel free to interrupt me. We need not wait for the Q and A. No. Whenever we use CSS printer, we never use class. We do it on element. Yeah. So, I don't think what I reset everything to some whatever the reset cases reset. And then after that, similar to what we did to work, we were at one time not get one. So, I got it. Reset still be sort of only giving both adding more to the other. Like, that's the first thing that's the reset. If you take one browser, then it's like duplicated. But we have many browsers to take care of. And the reason we are doing cases reset is to make it overall. Yeah. So, Anyway, that doesn't interfere with this methodology because we are styling the elements in that uh, preset, and here we are just uh, doing it on class name. And one more thing I forgot to mention: uh, when in this methodology, we won't be using ID selectors, which is because ID selectors are very specific in nature. So once you assign a style to an ID, then it becomes difficult to override it. If you have to override it again, you have to use that bang important thing and it's a nightmare like once you see the bang important then you know we have this wars if there are two developers one guy is okay my style has been over it and now I'll, I'll have to add one more thing specific to it then other guy will say okay I'll add bang important yay no beat that so these things happen then we have one more methodology called Max SMA CSS, which stands for scalable mod and scalable modular uh, architecture for CSS. Yeah, and it was uh, developed by Jonathan Snook, who works in previously worked, worked in Yahoo, but right now he's in Shopify. I think it has the same philosophy. Basically, the philosophy is uh, to identify reusable components, assign classes to it. Reusing instead of and uh, here also we won't be using ID selectors or dependent selectors. And in this methodology, uh, it's based on category, categorizing the CSS rules. So CSS rules fall under these five categories. One is a base, which is nothing but uh, combination of reset and a default look you want to give to a particular website. Then we have the layout. Uh, the, for the containers, then you have the module for the individual component, then you have state. This state, uh, uh, when I say state, it mostly has something to do with 
a user being logged in or not, or uh, if you take collapse panel as an example. So if the battery is open or not, I mean, all these things come under state. So for uh, assigning rules to this, we use a map. We use something like is hyphen or has hyphen, like is active, has border, or something like that. And finally, we have a theme layer. Uh, here, we just change the typography, colors, and if there any backgrounds, any those parts. So, what we do here is we make sure that a particular style rule, that any particular style rule should affect only one of the five layers. We shouldn't uh, conflict with any other. Suppose you are uh, you are styling a module, then you should never be using an element class because the moment you use an element selector, it will be conflicting with the base. So by ensuring this, you, what happens is the CSS is always you know properly well maintained. And in future, if you any time you want to add something, you will <coughs> put, uh, fall under one of these categories. So there won't be any. For this, uh, uh, I think boots, you know Peter Bootstrap? Yeah. yeah, Peter Bootstrap is a very good example of following this methodology. In Peter Bootstrap, we have uh, we never have a conflicting selectors for you know layout and a specific module. Anything in object oriented CSS, you have any query, any doubts? <coughs> yeah. Uh, depends. Like all that new developer who needs to know is which class to use. That is, he doesn't need to know how we are. Doing it, right? I mean, it's not implemented CSS. We are just adding a class for every new thing we are uh, designing. So it, it would one sometime it would happen that we have uh, classes for each and every possible element, and later we will just uh, mix, we will just mix and match and create new components. And maybe someday you won't be writing CSS at all. You will be just uh, writing adding classes to HTML, and that would be. That's a very bad practice actually. I mean, that, that's a very bad practice which we are suffering from. That is called firebug driven development. Ideally, you should never be using firebug by development. It should be only for debugging, mostly for JavaScript stuff. If you are using firebug to make any changes to the UI, like when I say UI, it's just HTML, CSS, then it's a bad thing, very bad thing. So, I think. Oh, no. Alternatively, yeah, whenever a new developer comes, let me know that these are the classes you need to add, so these are the classes available to you. If you want, uh, if you don't find anything to uh, get that styling, just feel free to add a new class. So we have a repository of all the classes and someday we won't be adding any more classes to the CSS. So it would be like a framework, we will just be using the same thing over and over again. But maybe we will have one stable uh, I don't think we need more than three. four classes. Mostly using four classes, we have many combinations to come up with. Right? I mean, I have never seen more than four classes being applied to anything. And moreover, this is not something very new. If you are familiar with jQuery UI and if you look at the HTML that gets generated on the in the runtime you have several classes attached to a single you know node so it's the same principle but we now have a fancy name and uh, you know it's cool to say i i follow object oriented then yeah in the
I don't think that that really depends. Like if, if your site is very huge, I mean you have many comp different components, then you cannot uh, you know add different uh, paddings and margins individually. And maybe it makes sense to have a classes for padding because it it would it would become consistent across in the design perspective. It is consistent across every element. Right? So that's fine. But I generally don't feel like using that because suppose someday we have to change a particular module, selling of a particular module, then we'll have to go there and remove that padding and that becomes a huge work. So other engineering I think they don't need to create any class code. Yeah, you can just remove it. But depends. Like if you have very large website, then that makes sense. If you if you have very simple log-like layout, then you don't need uh, extra classes for gutters and margins and padding. You can make use of normal, uh, you know, the module selectors and when I say module selectors, the classes and uh, be done with it. But if there is one more. Do we have time? Or yeah. There is one more method called BEM, which stands for uh, Block Element Modifier. I haven't researched much into it, but it has more or less the same philosophy. Identify a pattern, I mean, identify a reusable component, style it, and mix and match with different components and reuse it. So here, uh, unlike OCSS, OCSS, we have a block. So block in every Page is a uh, is like a brick. I mean, if you take uh, configuration as an example, it's like a brick. So you use those blocks and create the website. Um, one such example is the heading block, body, footer, and block can be nested. So you can have different blocks inside a block, like login block, search block, and whatever you can come up with anything. Then we have an element. Uh, the only problem here is. These elements are, uh, they have a meaning only when they are inside a particular block. So they are not context free. This is what I disliked about this methodology. Because these elements I cannot use anywhere independently. These elements should always be used along with this block itself. Then we have a modifier. Modifier is nothing but a class which you add to change, change the styling that is being given to this one. And uh, yeah, the common things in all is the way we look at the CSS architecture. Uh, the moment you look at a design, you, di you directly don't straight away, you know, start writing code. First, you look at the design and decide what all can be abstracted separately, and uh, what makes a component. What is the stuff that I can reuse? And yeah, then we have. Yeah, these things are common across everything. Like even if you look at uh, object-oriented CSS and SMACs, we had element agnostic selectors. We never use element selectors at all. We always use class selectors because uh, that can be assigned to any element you want. Then we had context-free selectors, except for BEM. For other two methodologies, our selectors are context-free. And all of them have the same goal that style should should not depend on the markup in the structure of the markup. It should be independent so that you can drag and drop put it anywhere. Uh, that's pretty much it. If you have any doubts, have a Q&A session. Then, yeah. Uh, when you consider uh, object-oriented CSS stack or ESG stack, where does less come into the picture? Yes, yeah. less is a less is a preprocessor. I mean, you know that, right? So, I think see every block, like media block, anything, if you want perfect. Uh, if you want a uh, proper independence, like 
instead of depending on a particular class, if you want to use the media object separately, then you are here uh, clearing the floats on the media object, right? So generally, what we do, we add a class, clear things or something, and we done with it. But in this case, you can have a mixing for clear fix and use it on every element, I mean every object. So that the generated CSS already clear fixes it. So that if you give this resource to any developer, you can directly copy paste it instead of including our entire CSS. That's what Bootstrap does. You can just take away make, uh, one small thing and that directly works instead of including the entire CSS. That's where I think the problem should uh, work well in this method. Yes. You can directly put them in and do that. Generally, it uh, works well with these methodologies. Like, if you follow this methodology and then try to use slash or less, it would be more more maintainable and the generated code is good. What right now what happens is if you don't know this uh, how to write maintainable CSS like normal traditional CSS. Then what you do is you keep on uh, writing more things and maybe it's maintainable from the backend, but once the CSS gets generated, that's a real mess. Look at it. So you think you can apply the same thing? Yeah, you can apply the same thing. It's a wherever you have manual work, like you are repeating something. So basically, you can make use of preprocessor to do that because. Yeah, I think uh, stuff like that are meant for machines to do, not humans. Right? So we can also do the big Is there any I mean, I have seen few benchmarks, and as per that, no. And actually, what happens is, if you use a class for the first time, when the when you when the browser creates a render tree. It uses the class, and if you use the same class next time, it takes very less time to create the render. So it's actually a performance bonus if you have reusable classes. But I think what multiple classes are saying it doesn't make much difference. Yeah, yeah. Because that's how Cascade works. Because the browser has inbuilt style sheets already. Author, we have author style sheet. Again, we have research. We have. Uh, side sheet coming from the JavaScript uh, plugins, so and so. But yeah, it doesn't uh, make much problem in the comments. And moreover, once you compress the HTML and everything, then everything falls down to the same thing. Like you, you won't notice any performance changes in that. So if you have to start a new project, you if you try it, I can never use stats. I recently started using less, but that too for only few things like branding, just for the variables for branding. And I follow object oriented CSS methodology. So whenever we have a new design, I don't right away start coding. I look at it, figure out what all patterns, what all objects can be abstracted. And doing that really makes it easy for other developers also because. I had an experience. After doing that, another developer came into the project and he found everything was already written. So he, all he needed to do is just use those classes and make a new component. Yeah. One good thing about SAS is uh, it has, I think if you use it with Compass, we have, we can make sprites and media, uh, uh, data URLs and other stuff. Maybe that's good, but I have no idea. Okay, thank you.